Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the afternoon panel discussion of the summit titled Reorienting Collections and Rethinking the Canon. My name is Sabi, and I work with the, with the Asia Art Archive as a researcher. It's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the Dhaka Art Summit for a very fitting context in which to be speaking about the areas that this panel is going to cover. Oh, I have to repeat everything? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, a little more light and a little more volume, please. There's usually like pin drop silence in the archive, so one just has to speak like this and it works. Okay, good afternoon again, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon panel discussion of the summit. And as you know, the title of this panel is Reorienting Collections and Rethinking the Canon. My name is Sabi, and I'm a researcher with the Asia Art Archive. It's a pleasure. To, to be here, and I want to thank the Takart Summit, which I just did again, uh, for a very fitting context in which to be speaking about the areas that this panel is going to cover, both in terms of the geographical, the cultural, and the institutional location of where we are right now, but also in the midst of some very fine exhibitions that speak of and from and to very complex historical locations. And here in this panel, we're going to talk about an institution that we all love, and one that's changing rather quickly and confronting an explosion of challenges, which is the museum. As you would have read in the booklet, the panel is about how museums are reorienting their programs and collecting when thinking about South Asia. It's a very specific topic in the midst of a number of very large questions that one can't help but think about pertaining to museums today. And we couldn't have a more distinguished uh, panel of speakers representing a really extraordinary cross-section of museums that I would quickly like to mention. To my, to my left, we have Francis Morris, um, the director of Tate Modern in London. Uh, Francis was appointed in April 2016, and until then she was the director of collections international art at Tate, in which uh, role she led the transformation of Tate's collection to reflect the global diversity of contemporary art and its historical antecedents. Francis is a board member of CIMAM, the International Committee for Museums and Collections of Modern Art. To my left also is Glenn Lowry, the all to my left, um, the director of the Museum of Modern Art, the MoMA, in New York. Glenn became the sixth director of the Museum of Modern Art in 1995. He's also a uh, trustee of the Association of Art Museum Directors and a member of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation's Board of Trustees. To my immediate left is Dorian Chung, chief curator and deputy director of M Plus Hong Kong. Previously, Dorian was associate curator of painting and sculpture at the MoMA, where he organized contemporary exhibitions, acquired works for the museum's collection, and at MoMA he organized some, some pretty important exhibitions, such as Tokyo 1955 to 1970, which really deserves mention, as well as primary documents on Japan, um, a publication that the MoMA brought out in the form of an anthology. At M+, uh, Dorian oversees all aspects of curatorial activities, including, again, collecting, uh, exhibitions and symposia, as well as learning and interpretation. And to my far left, I have Sebastian, uh, who's the dep deputy director of the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw. Sebastian is the, the, the chief curator at the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw and curator of a long-term public art project uh, of a sculpture park at, in Warsaw. Um, let's see, what else with Sebastian? He, he's produced a number of, I mean, something of interest to us in our discussion would be how he's in, interested in what he calls uh, art and post-artistic times. And so what is one collecting uh, around art and post-artistic times? So uh, please join me in giving everyone here uh, a hand in advance for what they're going to be sharing today. Now, at the risk of starting and stating the obvious, I think we are all increasingly aware of some major shifts in the cultural landscape of the 21st century. And some of these have had direct impact on our expectations of cultural institutions, whether it's a university, what do we expect of the archive, and what do we expect of museums today? Um, Andres Santos, a writer uh, a couple of, couple of years ago, outlined some, some of those shifts that are particularly urgent to the institution of the museum. And he listed them quite interestingly, which I wanted to share today. For one, there's an increasing scale of art production uh, and the inflation of values, financial values to say the least. So how do museums collect in times of increasing scale of artworks as well as increasing financial value of artworks? Uh, 
the dramatic increase in the expanding role of private collectors, which is um, how they might be shaping direction of museums, both in terms of gifts of art that might otherwise be unaffordable, or through financial patronage to museums, or even the creation of their own museum-like entities. The third that Andres mentioned was cultural policy, where public financing for museums and education are increasingly being questioned by the state. The fourth, globalization and expanded art histories, and how that is propelling museums into new regions and urging them to undertake new kinds of collaborations and collecting other regions. And last but not the least, technology, in how it's linking audiences to museums in very new ways, experiencing collections at far greater reach, and in some cases, technology even being a disruptive force for a lot of institutions. So all of these, I hope, would inform our topic of discussion today. And I hope with this panel, we can navigate our way through some of the issues around collection building. I work at an archive, so some of these questions confront us practically on a day-to-day -day basis. Perhaps what we can do is to address some of the very fundamental questions, such as how do museums collect? Where does the money come from? What are the ethical negotiations that are needed to be made between, say, private collectors and states? What kind of legal and regulatory obstacles uh, do they need to overcome to con continue their work? And then we can get into some of the more fraught philosophical and decidedly more political questions, such as how do you approach the question of expanding and complicating canons of art history in light of an increasing assertion of regional and complex modernisms? So the questions I would be asking are, how do you think about these issues when you're at the helm of major institutions where you have to make these decisions and uh, around very difficult questions on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of the questions that are not distant for quite many of us sitting here uh, in the auditorium are, well, even the question of Asia. Yesterday we had Rustam uh, bringing up how do we understand what, what is Asia and in our context right now for this panel, what is South Asia? Is it a post-colonial entity? Is it a place that is in elsewhere for somewhere else? Um, is it, I mean, basically he was asking for, for a much more troubled idea of Asia. I work at Asia Art Archive where colleagues and I at the organization are always reminded of the fact that there's a virtual question mark at, after every word in the name Asia Art Archive. Asia, art, archive, all of these are really put to question right now. And while, it, while A attempts building resources that bring light upon cross-regional histories and ideological networks, we can't stress enough the importance of seeing ourselves in conjunction with many other archival initiatives. So I think we're, some of these questions around museums also beckon how do each of these museums see themselves in a larger ecology of many other museums, besides, of course, many other publics. Uh, we, and we couldn't have a better group of individuals today. And, I, and what I'm going to do is begin with a few questions. And I hope that the conversation will also happen between the panelists. And then finally, we we'll open it out for Q&A. So Francis, if, if I may, I'd like to begin with you. Um, you've been a director of collections at international, of International Art at Tate, in which, as your bio describes, your role was to lead the transformation of Tate's collection to reflect global diversity of contemporary art and its historical antecedents. And I'd like to ask you uh, about the very process by which acquisitions are made, the very protocols, and this is really to understand the museological apparatus. Does, fun, does the question of funds come first and then you collect, or do you start having research committee meetings and decide what you're gonna collect and then raise funds, or both, any of those, whichever way you'd like to take it, Francis. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Well, please sh um, speak out if um, I become indistinct. Um, I think one thing to, to begin with is that uh, to make it very clear to um, everybody in the audience that um, we keep a very firm separation at Tate between what I would call our fundraising strategy and uh, our collecting framework. And both are things that have been expanding uh, very significantly since the beginning of this century, but with increasing momentum since 2006, where we decided to, as it were, go global with the collection. So the expansion of the collecting framework has uh, really been based on three principles. Uh, the first one is kind of decolonizing art history to encapsulate the kind of broadening of our understanding of 20 and 21st century art. Uh, 
The second is responding to the um, very significant uh, change in the way we think about the kind of media diversity. So historically, Tate was a collection of painting and sculpture. We now recognize that we need to be collecting across a much broader interdisciplinary field. And the third one was really to look at gender and diversity. So the three principles around the expansion of the collecting framework. At the same time, the fundraising strategy very specifically looked at geographical and in particular national identities and entities. And one of the reasons, or the principal reason for that is that we see art history increasingly as interconnected, but the individuals who uh, we seek to support us, feel very passionate uh, and are passionately associated with their own national and regional histories. So there's this kind of paradox between those two frameworks. But the key thing, I think, to share with you is the separation between the funding and the generosity and the enthusiasm for particular kinds of art and the decision-making process uh, within which we work. And one of the uh, ways in which we do that is that um, our acquisitions and the development of the collection are principally research-based so that we work, uh, we have a strategy for the overall collection and I've gone through the three principles of that which are very broad principles and the way they then pan out across each part of the world they land very differently but one of the things that I think is worth uh, emphasizing is that for us we're not trying to build um, seven or eight or nine, however you cut up the globe, we're not trying to build different national histories in parallel. We're really trying to build a networked, syncretic, kind of hybrid uh, understanding of the history of the 20th century art that very much reflects and is, is embedded within the collection that we all already have. And it's really interesting that Dorian's here today because he's building a collection from scratch, whereas we inherited a collection. It was European, very British, and Ameri North American. So we've got, some, we've got some stuff to work with. So we're networking out from that. And that creates for us the notion of relevance and is really helpful in working out how we should prioritize, how we assess what's important to the collection. And I talked about strategy, so we have an overall strategy. It principally looks at contemporary and historic, across the board, transnational, but then for the sake of helping us navigate regionally, we do have regional strategies. So I just, to demonstrate and prove to you we do have a regional strategy, here it is. Uh, it was all... She assures <laughs> me it really is true. It, it's a strategy, not a shopping list. It was written by Nada Raza, who's in the front row over here. And it, it really, it's, um, it's a guide, it's a guideline to us. It sets out some ambitions, uh, the kind of analytical framework of how we think about the region and then sets out how we might think about and what we might acquire. And this was written three or four years ago, and it's quite interesting that subsequently we have pretty much followed uh, Nada's vision for how we would build our acquisitions from the region. Of course, it sets out a framework for how we respond to contemporary practice. So maybe I should stop there and let somebody else speak, and we'll come back to some of the issues around ethics and so on. Yes, thank you. Um, Glenn, perhaps you might be able to address this as well from the standpoint of MoMA. Can you hear me if I just talk loudly? Yeah. <laughs> I think just, there's such an echo from the uh, microphone. Recording purposes, if I may. Sorry. Uh, archives, yes. Has, this has to be archived. Of course. Uh, so uh, our, our, our strategy is somewhat different. It has to do with how we were founded. Uh, we are an institution that that grows out of the DNA of the Bauhaus, so we are multidisciplinary from the start, from architecture and design to painting and sculpture, photography, uh, prints, drawings, and so on. And so each area of the museum that is medium-based pursues its own acquisitions, uh, and the acquisitions themselves grow out of direct curatorial interest and recently we have begun to have conversations across media so that rather than collecting as if we were seven independent institutions, we collect with one broad goal but then let each area pursue its own interest. So you could have, theoretically at the museum, an area that was deeply interested in pursuing South 
Asian architecture and another part of the institution that wasn't collecting in South Asia at all. Uh, so that creates a very complex series of intersecting networks within the institution. And all of our collecting comes from the initial interests of individual curators across both the 20th and now 21st century. Funding at the museum, again, breaks down to departmentally based initiatives. So every department, painting and sculpture, photography, and so on, has its own funding base, which grows out of individual dues that members of our acquisition committees pay to support acquisition. So every department has an acquisition committee made up of individuals interested in that field, that is that medium. So they pay dues. In addition, those departments have the freedom to deaccession or sell works of art from the museum in their collection in order to acquire other works of art. It's what our founding director, Alfred Barr, called a metabolic or self-renewing approach to the collection. And then beyond that, individual members or others within our family episodically will support an acquisition that interests them. So our funding um, doesn't break down by region, but rather breaks down by department. So the question then arises, how do we expand and complicate our own history when that history is tied to the medium rather than to various geographies? And so as we began to recognize that it was essential to expand our geographic interests from something that was largely but never uniquely European and North American to a more global position, we created a program called CMAP, or Contemporary and Modern Art Perspectives uh, for a Global World, that was purely research-based. So it had no mandate to generate acquisitions, but rather to take a opportunity to bring curators from every department, so to mix the media, and to uh, establish relationships and networks with artists, curators, collectors, and critics from different geographies. So we began, and Dorian was a pioneer, uh, with uh, Asia and specifically post-war Japan, Latin America, and Eastern Europe, again, post-war Eastern Europe. As, an, as a way of concentrating our ability to learn. Uh, and of course, if you bring a group of curators together to learn, uh, eventually that will generate publications, exhibitions, and of course, acquisitions. So rather than having a strict uh, strategy that was acquisition-driven, our, our strategy has been more about knowledge production with the underlying assumption that as knowledge is created, it will ultimately generate a plethora of outcomes, not the least of which will be acquisitions, but also the full intellectual apparatus around those acquisitions, such as exhibitions, publications, archives, and deep research. Thank you, Glenn. Um, and as Francis mentioned a little while back, um, we have Dorian to my immediate left, who uh, is in a very pe peculiar position where before the infrastructure of the building is in place, there's a collection being conceived. Um, Dorian, perhaps you can share how you're thinking about the very procedures of collection building, what comes first, what comes after, what comes simultaneously. Oh, should I repeat? Oh, so, um, I'm sorry. Dorian, can you maybe can you try check this? this one? So what I was asking, what I was saying was that uh, Francis mentioned a little while ago about the, the peculiar position that Dorian is in, where the infrastructure of a building of a museum is not in place, but the collection is being conceived for something like that. So both have to be thought together. So perhaps Dorian can share with us the very procedures, protocols of collection building 
at M plus. All right. Um, it's good to follow what Francis and Glenn said because these are two of some of the institutions that we really model ourselves after and benchmark and also think about how we are departing from them. And just a note on the slideshow that is running, you're not going to be seeing so much of about the collection, um, Southeast Asia, South Asia or wherever, because it is really an infrastructure building project in all sense, including the building itself. The final three slides has a kind of a collage of just some works uh, that uh, will give you a sense of the kind of diversity of mediums and genres that you will see, but that you will see mostly about the building itself. So uh, we, just before I start talking about the collection per se, um, the building has been under construction for about two and a half, half years now. We have another year to year and a half of construction to continue. Um, and then you will see some animations that kind of shows the actual construction status. Um, and it's a large museum. It's about 60,000 square meters of total space with about 15,000 square meters of exhibition spaces. So maybe comparable to the two previous institutions as well. Of course, what makes us different is, of, among many other things, that we are located in, in Hong Kong. Um, but now, um, while we've been working on this museum building project, which really began um, in earnest about six, seven, was about seven years ago with the first group of staff coming in and really starting the brief for the building, followed by the selection of the architect, Herzog and Demeron, so we share that with Tate Modern as well. Um, at the same time, uh, we have always been saying that the museum does not equal the building. The museum is also its content, which of course includes collections and programs, publications, and all the other, what Glenn called apparatuses. Um, it's also the people, you know, to run a large museum like this, we are projecting that we need about 300 core staff members, and it is quite a project to take on, especially in a city that, like Hong Kong, which is advanced in many ways, but not in terms of museum culture yet, so you can't really find people who are already trained in the museum practice. So we have to hire young people from our local communities, but also we bring people really from all over the world. I think at, elite, at the recent count, about 30% of our staff are from outside of Hong Kong or China and representing about 14 different nationalities, including myself. So this is out of necessity, but also it contributes to the, I think what I can say, a quite unique character of the institution as well. Now on the collection itself, um, I said that the museum project began in earnest about seven years ago, but before that there was a very enlightened group of people who came together under the name of Museum Advisory Group to conceive the Museum M+. They conceived it as a museum of visual culture of the 21st century, 20th and 21st century, um, that is rooted in Hong Kong, but with the mandate of also being global. And that was defined more in detail when the professional staff began to join. And we defined visual culture as essentially three large disciplinary areas of design and architecture, uh, moving image, and visual art. And these three areas, in fact, in many ways, I often think are quite similar to what MoMA is, that, that Glenn was talking about. Currently, six different departments of mediums um, can be grouped into these three areas that we're talking about. Geographically speaking, um, it is very much in our mission and vision that we are rooted in Hong Kong, a very, inter you know, arguably perhaps the most international city in Asia, um, and the, a city that's been formed by a certain openness and porosity throughout its history. Um, and then we expand from there. So, you know, in the early days, because people couldn't quite understand what that means. That, that you're rooted in Hong Kong, but you're global. So we had this diagram of concentric circles that showed Hong Kong, China, Asia, rest of Asia, and beyond Asia, you know, I mean, which is very rudimentary 
diagram, but we really kind of needed to show that so that people can understand that, um, in fact, any 21st century museum that's serious in looking at contemporary art and contemporary culture has to always start from where you are. And then that idea of being global is always incomplete it, or very subjective, but that's just how it is going to be. So I guess later we can talk about how our institutions can work together or complement each other, and it is just necessary because we all have very particular angle and we're all incomplete. Um, okay, so just find a few words about how the collection has been put together. So um, just funding-wise, we, at this stage of pre-opening of, uh, of the museum, that we are operating with a government funding that's given to us as one time. So we're using that money to build the museum. And then there's a separate fund that was set aside to build the foundation of the collection. Um, that's not going to be the case going forward. So we're also developing a different system of uh, philanthropy and you know, possibly endowment into the future. Uh, but even before we spent a single dollar from that particular fund, we received a very large donation from a private collector named Uli Sig, who put together a very important um, collection of Chinese contemporary art from the late 1970s to 2000s. And that really already positioned us as a very important institution to tell that particular art history. Since then, we have been putting things around it, through it, um, and completely establishing other cores. Of course, we had to collect from uh, Hong Kong, you know, many artists there as well. Uh, we have established a collection of architecture-related materials, many of them archival, and there are very few institutions in Asia that are doing that. Um, so, you know, all these different areas that I was talking about, we have been establishing them, but geographically speaking, we really started from where we are, Hong Kong and China, and then across other countries internationally within East Asia. And then finally, what I would say with relation to South Asia is that it's been very important to us in our conception from the beginning that Hong Kong is in fact located geographically um, and geopolitically and culturally at the juncture between East or Northeast Asia and South and Southeast Asia. So it makes complete sense for us to be looking as much at West and South from us as, um, as East Asia while you know, Hong Kong is often just thought of almost exclusively as part of China. Thank you, Dorian. And Sebastian, if you could also come I have on my this. own mic. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so as I'm in, in a slightly different position now, first of all, we have just finished like a 24 hour long workshop, uh, which was totally based on like dematerialization of art, on like dismantling the 19th century model of a museum as a kind of apparatus for storing, accumulating objects. So now I'm shifting to the other side uh, and uh, I'm representing a museum which is like the youngest creature here and the smallest and it's still under construction. It's a Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw. Uh, hopefully it, uh, it will be complete, the mission will be completed in 2020. Uh, it's a uh, ongoing fantasy dream of the Polish art community to have a, such a museum, to have a museum of contemporary art. Uh, it's, a, it's a slightly misleading name. We are a museum of contemporary art. Museum of modern art is a kind of like a working title. I don't want to go into details, but uh, they didn't like the abbreviation. MSW, it's, a, it's like the Ministry of Internal Affairs in Poland. And it's like this bad communist kind of connotation, so they didn't go for it. Contemporary is much more neutral than modern, as you see. And uh, so, so the, the museum was established in 2005, uh, more like an office, like headquarters for the future museum. Uh, we are like uh, facing uh, troubles, of course, you know, like we have like ups and downs when it comes to the whole process. In the end, we uh, have a design for the museum uh, by an American New York based studio, Thomas Pfeiffer Studio, and we are quite happy about it. Uh, we are very close, uh, working closely with the, with the architect. It's a very boring structure, but it 
fits very well our like needs and desires when it comes to the museum. And we haven't inherited a collection, so it's like everything starts from scratch, and uh, uh, we are building it, uh, especially with uh, uh, with uh, under the program. There was a program established in 2010, so the museum was established in 2005. Uh, ten, uh, five years later, there was a program uh, uh, set up by the Ministry of Culture and National Heritage uh, called. Uh, national collections of international art and there are only like four institutions in in, in poland which are cap capable of like applying for it it's uh you have to be a public institution and you have to deal with uh, a public museum which deals with uh, contemporary art there are four of them in poland so uh even though we are still like uh, in this kind of like a nascent uh, moment uh, stage uh, we are like fully operating as a yeah like a fully fledged uh, institution so we have an exhibition program oh this is the future the the white box uh, by thomas pfeiffer uh, we still uh, the, the funny thing is that we uh, know very well like the position of the like plaque sockets in the everywhere and the position of the desk but we don't know how the facade looks like so this is like the the last step you know so uh um so, so, so we, uh, as we are small, it's only like uh, we are growing slowly, but it's still like a medium-sized institution. It's it's thirty-seven people employed in the in the museum. Uh, so we are still capable of like meeting weekly and having uh, our curatorial uh, department, uh, which I'm supervising. Uh, ready to propose. So, so we are proposing the works. It's a lengthy process. I don't know. I, we haven't talked about like the time frame, but it takes around like two years uh, from the proposal. Like curators are proposing uh, works, particular works. We are discussing them, voting. Then it's being discussed by the uh, museum uh, uh, program board, uh, and then we apply. It's a very complicated like. Uh, 200 pages application and uh, we, there's like a rotating committee of experts judging it, mainly art historians and uh, museum directors, other museum directors. And, um, and then we can, uh, we, can, we, we can acquire a work. And this, this is an international collection, uh, like putting us on a map, you know, of course we started with this uh, desire of like, uh, yeah, creating our canon and the, our most, most uh, cherished uh, treasure is the legacy of the neo-avant-garde in Eastern Europe, like neo-avant-garde of the, of the 70s. So we started to build it with this uh, notion of uh, like inheriting certain like, uh, competences, imagination, values of uh, such artists as Kwiekulik from Poland, as Jan Grigorescu from Romania, um, Many, Sonia Ivekovic, Sonia, Sonia Ivekovic, like many artists from this, uh, Julius Koller from, from uh, the Czech Republic, from Czechoslovakia, previous Czechoslovakia. So it was, it was the beginning, but then we started to think about certain like uh, global problems, I would say, or issues, which might be illustrated or which might be triggered by artists coming from the other places. So it's not like a, geographically, it's very diverse, I wouldn't say like South Asia is so well represented, but we are going to change it. I will stop it here because it's like, you know, it's a simple procedure. Procedure. You have to be stubborn, you have to convince your colleagues, you know, like, yes. Well, there are some simple procedures, some of them really hard to get around, just in terms of the time it takes, but of course there's also the more complicated problem of deciding what to collect, when to collect, and what it's going to do to the canons of art history. And I think something that, uh, both Glenn and Francis brought up were about the intellectual apparatus and also about uh, Francis's uh, uh, emphasis on decolonization being one of the priorities. And it would be interesting to know actually, how does one think of decolonizing the museum? Given on the one hand, there is this uh, growing debate around how museums in their collections represent a sort of co colonial history in the ways they sort of expand into regions and try to represent them in certain light. And then on the other hand, in today's time, trying to reframe that canon 
trying to reframe the institution's own legacy, which is a bit of a difficult bind one is in, because obviously there's some very critical thinkers and some very fine minds at the helm of these institutions trying to figure this out. One still aligns with the museum, but given the museum's strategies to expand and to touch on other regions, how does one position this? And if I may add just one little anecdote or uh, a reference from a Borges story, which is when Borges was, uh, this is George Louis Borges, when he was reading Kafka, he, he confronted this one question that there's one way to read Kafka in which you study all of Kafka's predecessors and you think maybe that will help you understand Kafka better. But on the other hand, when Borges, looking more and more at Kafka, he realizes actually that once you start reading Kafka, you will never read Kafka's predecessors the same again. So perhaps in thinking about museums and contemporary collection strategies, uh, the debates and programming that museums are increasingly trying to develop, might that be a way to rewire the institution's own legacies? And to that, maybe Glenn and Francis, if you might like to uh, add something. And I mean, it's a, it's a tricky question, and it's, it's hard to really get an answer on, but it is being discussed all the time, and if you have any thoughts on this. So I, I'll pick that up uh, initially and then uh, turn it over to Francis, who probably has a, a, a different perspective. And the anecdote I want to lead from is something that Gertrude Stein, the great American expat collector in Paris, said to Alfred Barr, the founding director of the Museum of Modern Art, when he went to have tea with her uh, just before the opening of the museum's first custom-built building in 1930. Uh, six. And she said, you know, dear Alfred, you can either be uh, a museum or modern, but you certainly can't be both at the same time. Uh, which has to do with collections. Uh, because the dilemma for those of us who, who collect and who have been able to collect aggressively is that as the collection grows, it begins to take on a life of its own. It begins to impose certain uh, demands on the institution. Uh, and the larger the collection is, in fact, the less mobile the institution becomes intellectually. Uh, and she understood that because by modern she meant constantly changing, evolving, and being progressive. And so as your collection grows, so too does your own history. So Sabi, when you mentioned decolonizing histories, there's not only the decolonization of history, there's also the decolonization of one's own institutional history. And so one of the things that I think about a lot is the difference between collecting and displaying. So there are really two museums of modern art in New York. There's the Museum of Modern Art that is represented on the walls, and there's the Museum of Modern Art that is represented in the collections of the institution, and they are by no means similar at all. So for instance, with South Asia, the Museum of Modern Art in the 60s collected rather aggressively, especially in painting and sculpture and prints and drawings, South Asian material, South South Asian works of art. But those works hardly are ever seen on the walls of the institution, or at least that was true up until a decade ago. And the same could be true for other geographies. So how does one resurface those histories that are embedded in the institution, and what is the relationship between collecting and displaying? And so just to put out a, a bit of a controversial idea, I think museums have to fundamentally rethink collecting because if you acquire something and you don't show it, there is a utility factor that I think demands a rationalization and an explanation. And that the more similar the collection is to what is displayed, the more interesting I think the institution becomes. So there's a point uh, for debate, at least. Well, I, you know, in some ways, I couldn't agree with Glenn Moore that there is this um, fundamental distinction between what you have in your basement and what you put on the walls. Um, I think that when I first joined the Tate relatively a uh, long time ago, um, my predecessor, times one or two, as director of the collection, 
really believed that you could somehow aspire to collect a complete history of art. And he wrote in the early 80s, when he published you know, his life's work, the big catalogue of the collection, that it was almost complete. And there were very few gaps left to fill. Now, I think we've moved in, in 30 years from that idea that you can have a complete collection which you, you hold in storage to the idea that uh, Glenn just ended on, which is that the driver for collection building for us now is really about having a display collection, which means you're very agile and you're very responsive and you're responding to new ideas about rethinking art history. So when we talk about decolonizing art history, I don't think we mean kind of decolonizing to arrive at another fixed version of history, but a kind of continuous process of decolonizing, which really means looking at the collection and building it from a number of different perspectives. And the way that um, uh, exists in relation to our displays is that uh, throughout the museum, you will find displays very specifically organized around a perspective from a place in the world. So currently there's a, 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 um, a view from Tokyo, which is how the world looked from Tokyo 1970, for example. There's a view from Sao Paulo, how the world looked, or the world of art looked from Sao Paulo in the 1950s. So rather like this exhibition here around Persopolis, where you, you go to a part of the world and you see what did the world look like? What was artist practice doing? So that's one way of thinking about art histories and with a different narrative. But the other is to take some, for us, some of the really embedded bits of history in, in our collection, like uh, surrealism, for example, which we've always seen as a Paris-based movement with legacies in other parts of the world, Eastern Europe or whatever. And actually think, what did that mean if you look at that globally? So for us, that becomes a display, but it also then becomes a serious research project in collaboration with other organizations towards an exhibition. So the other thing that we could talk about, we probably don't have time, is how research and exhibitions then drive the development of the collection in a very dynamic way. Absolutely, thank you, thank you both. And on that note, if I can also ask Dorian and Sebastian, given these are museums in their conception stage itself, um, it's not just about the legacy of the museum's own collection or its own history that is being put to question, but the very legacy of the museum itself, the museum as a form, the museum as a, a sor sort of institutional form. So how would Sebastian, you and Dorian, yourself, be looking at rewiring the understanding of museums as you're developing these, these ideas and, and, and teams? Uh, you know, like generally speaking, I am an advocate of kind of decentralized internationalism. And this is like when we are, when it comes to like decolonizing, I would mention also other like D, which is like decentralizing and demodernizing and maybe even decanonizing. You know, canon is, is, is something which we are struggling with a lot. You know, we don't have it. We have to build it, you know, somehow, like, of course, it's a, you know, it's a very hazy beast, you know, like the canon, you know, like we can, we can, we can think about it as, as, a, as a house, you know, as a solid structure, as a piece of our conceptual architecture. You know, we can, we can live inside like happily. We like to be in a solid structure. Uh, there are also like advantages of, of, of having a canon when it comes to a kind of like historical consciousness, it, it, it feels good, yeah, to have a canon. But on the, side, on the other way, uh, on the other hand, it's uh, something really very basic when it comes to our practice. We have to question the canon, yeah? We have to like, like dismantle it, rebuild it. And it's not only about like traveling somewhere with your house. You know, we have a house. The house has a roof, it has windows, you know, it's like it's very well uh, designed. It designed in the 19th century, yeah? It's, it's, it's the 19th century model. So to, to, to kind of rethink the, 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 like the conceptual edifice of a museum, it's not only about like moving it around the globe. If you move it to Hong Kong, you know, like from Warsaw, we're still living in the same house, you know? Maybe it's all about like removing the roof. Maybe you, you want to live on a tree house instead of, 
you know, like being in the same edifice, which is so, it's a, it's a very disciplined, very rigid structure, you know, which really calibrates the way you think about art, about the separation of art and non, non, not art, and as Alan Capro would say, not not art. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a very well calibrated apparatus. And sitting, coming back to this metaphor of a house, you know, you can have like a nice fireplace there, you can sit on a, you know, sofa, but is it like the best, is it is, is, is a perfect like an observation point, you know, for looking at different tendencies, you know, like styles, genres and so on, but is it really like a place to have an impact on the place, on the, on the, on the outside reality? And this is what we are like dreaming of. Again, you know, like we are like facing this, again, this, this fantasy of having a real impact on the societies and the communities, of having, uh, of really, you know, like applying artistic competences to the non-artistic kind of communities and realities. That we believe that we have inherited something really valuable, this uh, conceptual like density, this uh, imagination which might be used for uh, changing the world, you know? So, so this is, this is uh, you know, I don't, I, have, I don't have an answer, you know? Like, and there are like many uh, museological mean, fantasies, like science fiction kind of thing, you know? Like there's like this, this fantasy about like Museum 3.0, for example, you know? Like a museum which is like really embedded in, the, in a kind of like uh, network of users, who are kind of like creating something together. It's not like a box, you know, for objects, but it's more like a kind of interface. So uh, we don't know, but uh, I, I can really uh, see that there are like many fantastic institutions all around the globe, you know, who are like really stretching it and testing the limits of a 19th century model of a museum. Mm. Um, Dorian, I think the, the question is also about the 20th century museum that M plus is. Is that even a question? Or is it trying to get the, right, the museum right in Asia? Well, I'm glad that you're saying 20th century rather than 21st century, um, because the, as I mentioned, the chronology of the museum collection and the programs is really second half of 20th century to the present. Um, but really the feeling and the position that I have, and I think the staff also share, is that before we start thinking about uh, being revisionist or decolonizing, we actually have to establish the baseline. Um, and I know that it's a very uncomfortable word, at least for the last 30 years, to talk about the canon. Um, but, you know, the canon isn't really a problem if you don't have never had one. So um, when you are given, and as I was saying in totally shameless and you know unabashed way that we were given the, the premier collection of Chinese contemporary art, which I think when you look back on the art history of the last half a century, one of the most remarkable phenomena, and then you are given this collection, then what you do is then to start revising the narrative because narrative hasn't been established, but you actually start establishing a narrative. Um, so that's kind of, that's why I think that you know you there are new practices and that there are new challenges to respond to, like that list of five items that you started out with by Andres Santos, and these are affecting all of our museum practices, whether you have been established for six years or eighty nine years. Um, but I think to before respond while responding to that in our case, then we also have to train ourselves and ensure that the basic museum practice um, has to be in place because that's not really something that you do a lot of experiment with. You can do a lot of experimentation with um, ideas and certain temporary things um, with the hope of having more accumulative, accumulative effect, but the baseline hasn't changed that much yes. from 19th century into the 20th century, into the 21st century. So the only thing I would say, Dorian, about canons is be careful of getting what you wish for. <laughs> well said. And, and to add to that, uh, I, th I think it's provocatively interesting to say what about canons where canons don't exist and as one is con con encountering more and more regions and the kind of research work happening there. Oh. I just would like to add because th th like this discussion is being really uh, 
advanced in Germany, you know, like there's like Hakave, this uh, House der Kultur and der Welt is having a program and you can like follow it online. It's uh, called uh, uh, Der Kanon Fragen, the, the Kanon Question. And, and they, they have this like this, this, this theory of like uh, hallucinating canon, <laughs> you know, like really like hallucinating canon. Yeah, yeah, it's like a canon which is kind of amorphous, you know, like shapeless and uh, changing, you know, like parasiting on the other canons, you know, like so. But uh, they have like really fantastic discussions, panel discussions. It's everything is online, so like the. I mean, I think some of these questions are really relevant and urgently being addressed by a number of institutions right now. And as Dorian last mentioned about. Uh, what about canons in places where there are no canons? I think increasingly there's an, er there's, there's an encountering of regional research that is happening where canons in various places are emerging and asserting themselves in light of other canons. And as much as it might be parasitical and complex, there are, of course, ways that canons have imposed themselves. I mean, once studied in educational institutions, come across books after books where there is a, there is a sort of uh, a certain itinerary of, of artworks and... Can I, can I just respond to that? One of the interesting things about, um, you know, there's a parallel discussion within the uh, uh, you know, schools of literature. And uh, in British universities over the last few months, there have been a number of calls for decolonizing, for example, the, the curriculum of English literature. And one of the really interesting things is that those calls are coming from the students. And I think we do live in an era now where we can think what we think the canon is, but actually there's huge pressure from our audiences and the people who consume what we do for a more diverse rendering of history. And we do live in a moment that all museums are now not just putting art at the center, they're putting the audience at their center. And one of the principal reasons I think at Tate that we have this very, um, in a way, open, opening up of the canon, it's not decolonizing, it's opening it up, it's diversifying, is that we live in one of the most multicultural cities in the world. And our audience want their history is reflected in our programs and in our collection. I was going well, to sorry. say exactly this, about <laughs> canons asserting themselves from various other places and various other. Yes. yes. Well, I, I just think the idea of a canon is a truly 19th century idea of how you look at bodies of material. And if you actually believe that museums of modern art are not actually the same, from a kind of ontological perspective or an epistemological perspective as a, muse as a historical museum, and I really believe they are not, then you have to ask, how do they remain different if over time they acquire collections and those collections end up framing, whether the institution intends it or not, some canonical notion of how to read art or how to read a history. So, the solution has to be, I think, to willfully fracture the canon and to refuse, to refuse the canon itself. And so those institutions like ours that have a longer history have a much harder problem uncoupling what they do from any notion of a canonical reading of art history. And I think the only way you can do that is to actually not show the same thing in any regularity, to keep the institution in motion, in flux. Uh, and the more, the more permanent a work of art is on view, the more you fall into the trap of one, becoming a historical institution rather than a modern institution, and two, inadvertently establishing a canon when if you believe that a modern institution should not be canonical by definition, should be experimental, should be proposing ways of reading art, not once but all the time, then you actually have to rethink the underlying idea of the museum itself. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. Uh, would you like to respond, Dorian, or, or, or I have another question in relation to this, which was that... I could carry on, it's like yes? a big... Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, which was uh, in line with what both of you so succinctly put. Um, there's, there's a subaltern study scholar, Partha Chatterjee, who talked about how uh, as more and more, more and more research has been done on, say, languages and their discourses within just India, 
you start realizing that the nation appears differently. The nation is a different formation from different linguistic spheres, from the different linguistic worlds. And so, in a sense, the world or the canon appears differently from different locations, and maybe those appearances then start are either contesting with each other or somewhere coming together uh, with each other. And so on that note, I wanted to ask you if, how you conceive of, say, uh, this polyphony, which you're calling of, of canons or the non-canon, um, how you might see this in relation to not just how the museum is conceiving it in its own infrastructure and its own team, but also collaborating or recognizing the other canons with other institutions. I mean, in a nutshell, how to think of museums as a collaborative project with other museums that are happening around the world? Are there instances where this has been attempted? Um, are there ways that you're thinking about this? Maybe I can just briefly talk about one um, example. I mean, w collection building, we've talked a lot about, but one of, the, one of the really important ways that we build Tate's collection is through collaboration. So we have a huge collection that we work we jointly own with the National Galleries of Scotland. Uh, we're working with MoMA and uh, San Francisco MoMA on a New York Trust collection of uh, new media work. But more recently, we've uh, been acquiring work jointly with the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney, where we have no, really, a, we do not have a history of collecting. And what's been fascinating about that proposal is it's pushed us into an area of collecting that we probably wouldn't have entered had we not worked with curators and had a kind of research perspective from you know, the, the other side of the world, and that's in relation to indigenous art. And I don't think we would have moved in that direction without kind of um, a kind of hybridization of the vision because of the collaboration. It's been incredibly enriching. And now that we have, um, we've begun to acquire um, urban Aboriginal art or in art with an indigenous root, it's going to, I imagine, have a pretty profound impact as we move forward. We've, I've always had this idea that we should collect the uncollectible, at least as a kind of um, thought process. You know, never think you can't collect something. As soon as, you, as soon as you think you can't collect it, you've just got to find a way. And that's really interesting in relation to this collaboration. So it's this very much a very dynamic momentum when you start working with partners who are very different to yourselves. So I would add only that the, the idea of collecting, which of course is in and of itself an idea of the institution that goes back to the Enlightenment, is a hierarchical process and as we become more and more familiar with a digital culture that's networked and organized differently, the whole ownership of, the whole issue of ownership, I think, begins to change radically. I don't think you have to collect something to display it. And I don't think because it's displayed, it can't be written into an institutional history. Uh, and that's different than a temporary exhibition. Those are a kind of churn. You develop those as tests, as ways of exploring different ideas. But there are different rhythms, different um, lengths of display that can become modalities of operation. And so I think the further we push ourselves to move away from the notion of ownership as a central mission of an institution's uh, idea, the more interesting it can become. Now, I, I, you know, we're an institution that has become obsessed with ownership, so we have a lot of therapy to do uh, before we will get there. Uh, but we are experimenting with partnerships, whether they are the New Art Trust, as Francis mentioned, or working with a foundation um, in the United States to redistribute collections to other regional institutions and to then also tap into the collections of those regional institutions or jointly acquiring works of art with sister institutions or a partnership we have uh, in Wuch uh, to share material from our collection that is difficult to, to access uh, in, in uh, Wuch and for us to be able to share uh, in some of the great holdings of Eastern European modernism uh, that museum has. There are many different ways of breaking this open, but I think you have to start with, is it essential? 
is it essential for a museum to collect in order to fulfill its mission? Uh, thank you, Glenn. Dorian, would you like to come in on, is it necessary for M plus to connect, collect? I, you know, I do think about that same question too, because uh, resources are always limited, right? Um, and then the ownerships can be competitive, you know, who can get there fast and, you know, all of these kinds of things. Um, and then, of course, the, with the digital culture, as Glenn um, was just describing it, is changing the relationship to images and objects themselves too. So I think that will obviously have impact on how we are practicing museums and collections as well. Um, but again, we're in the stage of establishing something. And then very much part of that mandate is to create a permanent collection. Um, and then I guess another thing that I will want to add is that you know, we all operate in different systems of governance. And that also brings to different systems of expectations as well. So our collection, even though we're not governmental, uh, but the permanent collection of the museum is set up first and foremost for the benefit of the citizens of Hong Kong because the whole project was initially funded by the Hong Kong government. Um, so, you know, at some point perhaps we, even the, you know, of course I do think about the, the ideas of collaboration, potential collection sharings and, you know, all of these ideas which I want to absolutely pursue, but then there are certain legal structures as well as the mandate that was originally given to us that, that we also have to um, deliver and then work through as well. So I just wanted to point out that say, you know, the who um, legally, who is the beneficiary of the collections are all very different from us and then that actually exerts a very important effect on how we practice them. They are not all the same because we are all meant to be public collections. And Sebastian, uh, post art, is it to be collected or? <laughs> Uh, it's to be shared, but uh, it's really like your question triggered something, uh, like triggered some like historical examples, you know, when it comes, I think, well, like history of like museology based on compassion and solid solidarity has to be written one day. I'm, I'm thinking about such examples as the Skopje Museum of Contemporary Art, which was built after the earthquake. Skopje is ex-Yugoslavia. It's a... Uh, uh, now it's Macedonia, and after the earthquake, they've decided to uh, the, the the city council decided to build a museum, museum of modern art, and it was so fast. It was like in a few months they collected, uh, they 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 were donated a collection of uh, more than 300 pieces, including a Picasso. Uh, artists and institutions were sending works to Skopje knowing that this is like a symbol of a kind of immortality of the place. So it's, it's, a, it's a museum which is based on solidarity. Think about the inter international art for Palestine from 1978. Uh, think about this, like this beautiful British example uh, in 1946, a woman called Brenda Ronsley uh, initiated a, a, a scheme, a kind of program called School Prints, uh, she approached, she wasn't, she wasn't an artist, she wasn't a curator or a custodian, she had nothing to do with, uh, she was a spy, yeah? <laughs> but, yeah, but uh, the thing is, uh, she approached some artists uh, to produce like lithographic prints and they were collected as an exhibition which was donated to primary schools, like more than 4,000 4, copies, I guess. In, in, in the 40s, it's like who owns it, yeah? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a collection, you know, it's not in a museum, it's a, in a primary school, it's being shared, it's being like cherished, uh, it's a beautiful idea and also like conceptually quite stimulating. Can you have an exhibition in many places at the same time, like the same show, you know, like who owns it? So like you ask about the post-artistic practices, I wouldn't like to go into now like a lecture because we have just established a museum here in Dhaka only for 24 hours it's a conceptual entirety and uh, uh, we are collecting uh, ideas concepts but this idea this 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 like the very uh, this 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 idea of collecting ideas it's nothing it's not uh, a fantasy uh, we have entered this uh, 
confederation of museums, of kind of middle-sized European museums called La Internazionale, uh, including such such uh, institutions as Magba in Barcelona, MUCA in Antwerp, and our the, like this this co co confederation was established to kind of facilitate like the exchange between like collection departments. It's to make it like the whole procedure kind of smoother to kind of connect all the to make them like shared. It's a I'm sitting in the far right, uh, far left. Sorry, I'm like I feel it. I, it feels good to be far left. So <laughs> to, to our La Internazionale yes. socialist idea of sharing and exchanging and uh, using it and like uh, having works in a public domain is quite vivid. And uh, so we have uh, been very much inspired by the Museum of Arte Util, this concept uh, uh, delivered by, by Tania Bruguera. Uh, we are thinking about a joint acquisition of certain instruction-based pieces which might be activated by the users. So, so it's a completely, I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's quite a shift, yeah? You don't have an object, you have like an instruction and it's given to the people. So I think it's, it might be one of the ways in the future. Yes. Yeah. Protocols, instructions, cookbooks. Yes, yes. Um, I have seven pages of questions, um, but we have only 10 minutes left. So let's open the floor to questions if, if I may. Yes. Um, questions from the floor? We have... Um, can we have the lights on, please? I think it would be nicer for everyone to see each other. Hi. Um, no lights. Lights on us. Yes. I, I would like to push a little bit further to what Mr. Laurie said uh, during um, uh, a podcast that he did for Artists Agency. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Um, that you said that the most important thing for a museum was the programming and you were, you were hoping to uh, improve and increase uh, the programming that you could do in the um, uh, MoMA. Uh, Mrs. Morris mentioned that the most important is the audience. Um, and there's been very important shows that you, you did, uh, the M Plus did the gender, um, the gender exhibition in, uh, in Hong Kong, you did the Black Power uh, at, um, at the Tate. Um, so programming, for the public is the most important. In a way, they don't care about who owns the works. Um, I'm a private collector, and one of the conditions I, 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 I give to the artists selling to me is that they will always um, have access to the works for lending it to any institutions. So I would, shouldn't be an acceleration in that process of, of asking that question about what is it collecting, you know? It is part of the status of your association of, of collecting because, for example, the Wheels in Brussels is a non-collecting institution. But when people go there, they go to a museum. They don't care in some way. But part of your status is still that you have to collect to be part of that group of, peop of people. Shouldn't, be shouldn't you accelerate a little bit that, um, that process, taking into account that there are collectors organizing, you know, the Walton Network, uh, Eli Broads um, doing things. And the same with people like us. I mean, we have many works that we're ready to lend to any of the institution asking for it. So shouldn't be an acceleration of that kind of very slow motion of, um, in the collecting world that you cannot compete with the private collectors. Uh, you don't have the means anymore. So can you, um, sh should you accelerate that process? Uh, yes. I think we can continue to pe compete with private collectors pretty significantly for um, many years ahead. I mean, collecting is a, a fine art. I mean, one of the things that I think museums do have is a responsibility to artists to ensure that their work is collected and is looked after and is cared for in perpetuity and is made available to the public, either in their institutions or on loan. So one of the, one of the answers to having a storage facility full of work, as all of us museums do, is to make the work available to the public. So we have a scheme in the UK called Artist Rooms where over a thousand works are out there across the UK from the north of Scotland to the very southwest in Cornwall at much smaller venues, at, at regional museums, at, 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 at public galleries, small spaces that on their own would simply not have the, the lending power to ask for a room of Warhols or a, a great collection of paintings by Agnes Martin. And so the, museums do have a national museums, regional museums, I think feel enormously responsible for um, supporting artists' endeavors. 
and facilitating access uh, to those works for, uh, for, for a very broad and diverse audience. And that's, I mean, when I talk about the centrality of the audience, uh, they might not care who owns the work, but they really do want to see the work. And we take a responsibility for ensuring that, you know, the, the most interesting, most relevant, you know, in a changing world, that we keep, keep providing different perspectives through extraordinary works of art. Maybe we can take another, another couple of questions if anyone else doesn't have a right. friend here somewhere. Um, I have a very simple question. How do you, since we all have become global, how do you define the parameters of where you don't look or where you stop looking when you go around collecting or exhibiting or doing things? Everything has become accessible from South America to the end of Siberia. I mean, everything is within reach in a way. So how do you set the parameters? Well, there was a discussion early on on how parameters are set of um, what kind of research is to be done, what kind of mandates are to be followed. Any responses? Well, that is a fundamentally important question, and I suspect each of our institutions w would answer that differently. We don't aspire to be a global institution in the sense of representing artists from everywhere, because we can't. And it's, but we can pay attention to where, we can pay attention to where artists are working regardless of geography, whose ideas and work intersects with our own, and to look at how we can expand the conversations that we can create within our galleries. And research becomes the fundamental driver. Uh, so the programs that we have, research programs we've established, start with where our curators interested in learning more. And, and our commitment is that we go deep, that if we say we're interested in Latin America, we stay with that for a very long time so that we're not glossing Latin America, but we're developing a long and sustained relationship with artists, curators, um, critics in that area who help inform us about what actually is really important and perhaps learn something from us in return. And so it's very much about sharing information, developing new sets of networks, and that those networks, and that's the interesting idea about a network, are constantly expanding and reconfiguring themselves. And so where um, Francis used the word about the importance of a permanent collection, that works of art enter our institutions with permanence. We are a private institution, and I actually think that's exactly what should never happen. That our collection should always be in flux, should always be changing. Work should come in, and work should go out, and there should be a constant debate about that process. And that would, that would make us different than a historical museum whose mandate is to have a permanent record. Uh, if, if you believe that the idea of modernity is that it isn't yet fixed, then the notion of a permanent record becomes deeply complicated, and that would allow our institutions actually, over time, to, in a sense, engage with and retreat from different issues, different places, and different artists. It's a utopic vision. Thank you. There was a hand raised over here first, then after that, Rustam. Um, hi. I think uh, a topic that hasn't been addressed are donations. 
For example, when a collector wants to donate their pieces to the museum, do you have a policy for choosing what to receive or not? For example, Patti Cisneros have been donating uh, part of its collection and there are other collectors that want to donate and maybe the museum don't want to receive their pieces. Maybe Dorian can begin, given um, you mentioned the Ulisig, but I'm sure there are many more examples that are, that are coming up that you might... I mean, I would imagine that all the museum colleagues would say um, that all donations are considered in the same way as all the other acquisitions are considered, that, that they fit the mission and the strategies and the parameter of the collection that have been set by um, the curators and the director of the institution. So I don't think we take any of the donations at, uh, uh, you know, at, yeah, I mean, they, they do have to fit and they have to be considered in the same way. I, see. I, just, I, just, I, I think I'll just add one thing to that. I completely agree with you, Dorian. We try not to think about, I mean, we think about donations in terms of quality and relevance in exactly the same way that we think about acquisitions. But I think um, quite often people think that donations are things that just kind of come at institutions like out of the sky or, you know, you receive a letter one day. Actually, donations are something that most museums really actively seek and are very, very hungry for, and just make, you know, just so extraordinary when people do donate major works. It, it, it's hugely important to us, and we so value uh, those relationships with those people who give us great works of art. I think so. Yeah, yeah, I, I would just add, because we, yeah, it's exactly the same procedure. It's so lengthy, so time-consuming, you know, it's not, it, it, it's, sometimes it's a trouble, you know, like a donation might be a trouble, but, Honestly, uh, like our museum was also like based on donations, you know, because like we were meeting this, you know, all those like expectations from the art community and like really like key artists in Poland, like Mirosław Bałka, Paweł Althammer, Artur Miejewski, they all like donated works to constitute something, you know, to start with something. And we have like really key works in the collection because it was like the, finally we, we are going to have a, important museum, you know, like museum which is dealing with like recent, like contemporary art. Um, just one last question, and after that, yeah. if you can thank you. it short. Uh, uh, it's been a very rich session, thank you very much. Uh, you've given a lot of clues, uh, provided a lot of clues about what is very important to me in thinking about museums, and that is its ecology. Uh, I think the big museums, that's MoMA and Tate, and they've been very candid and you know, wonderful kinds of insights provided by their directors. One problem could be excess, scale, you know, having so much, as you very candidly put, that what you've got in your basements you know, is not necessarily shown on the walls. So my very practical question would be, how do you scale down? If you're going to constantly collect and collect and collect, then what are your strategies of decollecting, or whatever you want to call it? And I think you have provided very interesting possibilities. One is sharing and redistribution of resources. That seems to me like uh, a very, uh, it's working more in the direction of a gift economy instead of the capitalist economy in which your ideas of the museum are still placed, you know. So maybe how do we, in a sense, uh, activate new strategies of the gift economy in the context of museums? That would be, you know, one question to there are many other ways in which we could think of ecology. Well, architecture, for example, what is, how much do you pay for electricity in MoMA or in, at the Tate? How do you cut down on those running expenses? And here I think uh, maybe architecture does play, the kind of architecture you have is important. I'll stop here. Yes. He's giving the question too. Anyone? Uh, I just very briefly, I think that's such a lovely question to end on because it gives us some food for thought. But of course the future is in dispersal and sharing 
I mean, we live in an age of collaboration. None of us want to see our collections in the basement forever. Um, you know, the, the, the world is full of museums. The UK is full of museums. They have collections too. So, you know, generosity, exchange uh, to mutual benefit is, is obviously part of all our futures. And I think we have to go on a collective diet. I, and I'm not joking. I really am not joking. I think we have to go on it. There, you have to think about new networks. You, you have to think about different ways of sharing the collection. But you also have to go on a diet. You have to stop believing that your mandate is to acquire. And we are collectively structured to be acquisition machines. Uh, through collecting committees, through the way our funding is received, whether it is at the Tate, MoMA, M+, it doesn't matter. We are designed to spend money to acquire, and that doesn't make sense in this century. And I have like uh, an idea. <laughs> what you can do with the, our storage rooms, you know, like uh, following your, like, the economy of gift, you know, we have to find a way to activa activate our collections in like non-museum spaces, like hospitals, schools, and so on. And this is what is happening, you know, like the Van Abe collection is being to be presented in a squat in Amsterdam. Because it was like, you know, it's one of the legal kind of entities. So they selected works for showing in a, like an anarchist squat. So I think this is one of the futures, you know, to leave the museums, to leave the box. Would you like to have a last word, Dorian? Or? Just simply say that I will be very happy to join Glenn's collective diet. Uh, <laughs> and, but, and, but it's not just the machine uh, of museum that is wired for perpetual accumulation and collection, um, but it is the capitalist logic that has been perpetuating all of us, you know, all aspects of the ecology, in fact, you know, and that, that doesn't exonerate the artists either. You know, it's artists, dealers, curators, and it has, it's not just in financial terms. Also, I think it is in the terms of our ego and desire that is also insatiable as well. So just to be aware of all of that is very important. And it's not just museum to decide on policy level that we're going to collect less, so we're going to be less rapacious, but I think it's the collective uh, self-reflection on the um, relentless production. This. <laughs> There's something wrong with the mic. This mic, I think. Hello. Hello. Um, hello. Okay, so I said that I would totally go and uh, join the collective diet that Glenn was talking about. Then. Um, Yes, so, so it is not just the museums that are built as machines for constant collection and acquisition and accumulation, but we all need to self-reflect on the capitalist logic that we're very much part of, you know, all aspects of the ecology, whether you're artists or dealers or curators, and also it's not just in financial terms, but it's the ego and desire that is constantly driving the relentless production that, that we are always part of, so it's very important to be aware of that as well. It's not just for museums to change its, its policy and practice. Um, hello. This has been an enormously enriching uh, panel, and I really can't thank you all enough for sharing such deep insights and such sharp insights uh, into the discussion that we've been having. And you've been an excellent audience. Uh, thank you all. Thank you to the panel. A big round of applause for... <laughs> Have a good evening and enjoy the Dakar Summit 2018.